Welcome to Question Time, which tonight comes from the debating chamber of the Oxford Union. And on our panel, the Conservative Work and Pension Secretary, Damien Green, Labour's former Shadow Defence Secretary, Clive Lewis, for the Liberal Democrats, Joe Swinson, who was Business and Equalities Minister in the Coalition, the SNP's Europe spokesman, Stephen Gethins, and the journalist and former policy advisor to David Cameron, now in the House of Lords as a non-affiliated peer, Camilla Cavendish. Thank you, thank you very much. And uh, in this first programme since the announcement of a general election, you can, of course, call, um, join in the debate from home. You can either do it on Facebook or Twitter, or you can use text 83981, push that red button to see what others are saying. Our first question tonight from Priscilla Fisher, please. Priscilla Fisher. Has the general election been called for the benefit of the Conservative Party and not the country? Has the election been called for the benefit of the Conservative Party, not the country, Clive Lewis? Yes, uh, quite clearly it has. Uh, I don't... <laughs> <laughs> and I'm quite pleased to say that I voted against it, because I think it's a, a very cynical ploy. She's gone into this election, the Prime Minister, uh, having said 11 times before that she wouldn't call an early general election. And what she's worked out is that her chaotic plan on Brexit and the policies that she and her government have embarked upon uh, since 2010 mean that, with also with the internal dissent within her own party, she needs to go to the polls now. And I think most people in this country will see it as a cynical, manipulative ploy mm -hmm. to try to maximise on what she's doing, when actually what she needs to be doing is bringing this country together in one of the most uh, chaotic and, and, I think, undermining uh, situations that we have seen as a country in the post-war period. She's not doing that. It's divisive. And I think, uh, quite simply, uh, she's out of line. So why didn't you get your whole party to vote against it? Um, I think the decision that the, my own party made uh, to go and vote for this was wrong, uh, and I went through a different lobby to them. But I understand why, because when Theresa May and the policies that she is putting forward, day in, day out, as many MPs, many on this table will know, they're having a devastating impact on our communities. In Norwich South, I see people coming in every week telling me about the hardship that they're in, about the difficulties in the NHS, about the homelessness that people face, the hardship. And my party felt, and Jeremy Corbyn, the leadership and the shadow cabinet felt, that we had to take Theresa on if she offered this opportunity. But, it, but, but, it, but he was wrong. I think that what we should have done is that we should have said to Theresa May, if you want to be so manipulative, then we'll quite happily vote for you in a vote of no confidence in your own government. And if you want this election badly enough, then vote, uh, vote okay. against yourself. OK, in... Joe Swinson. Well, yes, this election has been called for the benefit of the Conservative Party. As I think it was said uh, to Theresa May, you know, what part of the 20-point lead in the polls made you think that calling an election would be something that would be good to do? Um, but this is an election that can benefit the country. There are millions of people across the country who woke up on the 24th of June last year devastated that Britain had voted to leave the EU and have looked on in horror as events have unfolded since. There are also millions of people who voted leave but who didn't vote for Theresa May's hard Brexit, which includes leaving the single market and wrecking the economy. And so there's plenty of people who look at politics, see that it's broken, see a Conservative government that has just gone for the hardest of all Brexits and have been able to get away with it because, frankly, the opposition in the Labour Party has been hopeless. So this is the chance to change the country, to get a much better deal for the country and to have an opposition that can actually hold this hard Brexit government to account. I'll come to you in a moment. Damien Green. Uh, I find it quite extraordinary to have uh, 
opposition politicians saying, oh, the government's terrible, but we don't want an election. We don't want the people to decide uh, whether the government's any good or not. Uh, it's, it's exactly what you said, Clive. You went into a, an attack, uh, but then said, but, but I didn't want an election, which but is absurd. But didn't you pass a law saying it not, wouldn't be until 2020? Well, Parliament passed a law. The Prime Minister was quite straight about this. She, she didn't disguise anything. She said she changed her mind for two reasons. First of all, because the, the, the Brexit process, it, I mean, it was uh, Joe's leader, Tim Farron, who said he was going to gum up Parliament, he was going to grind uh, the government down, and they got, there's 100 peers, uh, Lib, Lib Dem peers in the House of Lords who could do that. So they would, they would make the Brexit process chaotic. And secondly, and, sec and secondly, there is, I, I love it the way nobody is allowed in World Teenage Ways when they all get together. It's the coalition of chaos made, uh, made flesh these three. <laughs> The point is also that there is actually a window where you can have that now because uh, the European Union has gone away to think about its uh, negotiating tactics so we can have an election now and out of this election, if people vote Conservative, if we have uh, a Conservative government returned under Theresa May, we will then have a stronger and more stable government that will get the best deal for Britain in these vital Brexit negotiations. I can't overstress the importance. We need a good deal for Britain. We need a strong and stable government under Theresa May to get that deal for Britain. Can I, sorry, can I just yes, pick, pick up on this? Look, I relish the opportunity to do my bit to get rid of a Tory government and the damage that they have done. But I'll tell you this. We had an EU referendum to try and sort out a Tory civil war. We're now having a general election to try and sort out a Tory civil war. And all the end time, we're having more chaos, more uncertainty for jobs and the economy. What's the, Tor what's the Tory civil war that's going on at the moment? Well, if, if you looked at it, the only reason you don't see a Tory civil war going on is because the Labour one's much worse. But there's a hard Tory Brexit <laughs> being driven by the hard right of the Conservative Party that's taken us out of the single market that will cost jobs, that's leaving us with no uncertainty over things like research funding, which is crucial in areas like Oxford and crucial in areas like I represent in St Andrews as well. People's jobs rely on this, and you're using it as a political tool to take advantage of the mess that but they But hang on a second. Are you saying, then, that Theresa May wants a soft Brexit, and by getting a bigger majority that the polls suggest, well, the you're going to is, get a kind of Brexit is, you want? Is that The what problem you're is, because we went through the gross irresponsibility of Vote Leave campaigning on a blank piece of paper, nobody's told us what kind of shape that leaving the EU will take. Now, there are jobs in the economy. Now, look, we'll debate this in Parliament. And do you know what, Damien? Having scrutiny in Parliament is a good thing. It's the point why we are here. It's the point why Joe's standing again, I'm standing again, Clive's standing again. It's a good thing, and it makes for better but government. Now, wait, wait a minute. The SNP is... a good thing. OK, uh, I, I, just hang on a second. I'm going to get a lot of hands up in the audience. Let's go. I'll come to you, Commissioner. in a moment. Uh, I, I said I'd go to you at the very back there first, and let's hear what you all think. One of the benefits of um, this election is that, as of the 9th of June, we actually stand a fighting chance of a process of getting a, uh, an opposition leader who is credible and stands a chance of winning in 2025. Or 2000, five years from now, 2022. Because it certainly won't be happening under Corbyn. What, so you think the election's achievement will be that Corbyn will well, Corbyn will resign. stand down as of the 9th. It will be a disaster in the polls. We might get an effective opposition leader. What makes you think he would resign if he were defeated? I think it's a foregone conclusion, isn't it? I don't know. I'm asking you. Um, let me go up there to the woman in the, in the back row. You. Why was the general election not called before Article 50 was triggered? Mm. Mm. Yeah. Camilla Cavendish. So, I'm going to make myself quite unpopular, I think. I'm going to come back to your question and say that I actually think it's both. I mean, clearly the election is for the benefit of the Conservative Party. Anybody with a 20-point lead, political parties are cynical, vote-winning machines. You know, she's going to capitalise on that. But I have been really worried that we would put ourselves in a position where the government of the day was going to be focusing from 2019 onwards on winning the next election, just at the time when they would need to be properly negotiating with the 27 other countries that we need to do a deal with, and that she would be under enormous pressure from her right wing, she's got quite a small majority, to do some things that I certainly wouldn't agree with, and I think she needs some more room to manoeuvre. That does not, and that's why I actually think it's a good thing if we can get 
a longer period to have this negotiation. That does not mean that I don't agree with Stephen that we absolutely need parliamentary scrutiny of that process at the yeah. same time. But I do think this is a unique election. This is a very dangerous moment for this country. We have a huge and important negotiation that I'm afraid I think transcends politics to some extent. I mean, we just need to get the best deal. It's very hard that half of it's going to be done behind closed doors, yeah. which is it's very hard to get your head around. But I do think that having a bit more time might give us a better chance as a country. I think that's it. Okay, you say. Joe, hold the point and I'll come to you. The man there in blue, yes. Me? Yep. Um, for months, people have complained about Theresa May not having a mandate for a hard Brexit. But now she's gone to get a mandate. People like Clive Lewis are still complaining. When will Theresa May win? OK, and you sit in the front here. Uh, I think uh, Tim Farron brought up uh, an interesting point uh, at, uh, at PMQs a couple of days ago that the, the legacy of this parliament will be the absence uh, of an effective opposition. And uh, I think maybe the Labour Party would, needs to thank Theresa May for, for calling the election because if nothing else, it will sort out the mess that is in the Labour Party because we need the Labour Party working and functioning as it should be an effective opposition, if that is where it is going to be. Do you agree be. with him? You're... No, I don't agree with him. I'm shaking my head. No. I that's thought you that. were nodding uh, your head. No, 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 no. I'm saying no. Well, we, we... Can I just come back to a couple of points? Just very quickly. Well, come yeah, back to his point. point. No, I... Take his no, point. No, it was made up there too. Well, the, 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 I... Save the Labour Party if you're disagree, defeated. Is respectfully the point. disagree with the gentleman. And I think I find it interesting that if you wanted, if Theresa May wanted a mandate, uh, she was she was busy. The Conservative Party were busy telling us after the referendum when they were interpreting what that result meant, that the British people had spoken. She had that mandate. And when she became Prime Minister, unelected, that's when she should have called the election. And I find it laughable that you would say, uh, Damien, that we've, you've called the election because nine Liberal Democrat MPs who voted three different ways in Article 50 are the opposition that are going to uh, stop uh, the Brexit negotiations. I find, frankly, laughable. It's, it's this is more less in the House about, of Lords. This is, I said that. This is, well, this is less about, about, this is right, less let, about let, one nation choice and more about having a one-party state. That's okay. actually what you want it's, in this country. Dan, I think being Dan, accused Dan. of having a one-party state when you just called an election is just absurd. This is a democratic process. And interestingly, the, the one thing I haven't heard, I, I campaigned on the Remain side. I was, I was on the board of Stronger In, so nobody fought harder for Remain. But unlike the impression I'm getting here, I'm a Democrat. I accept the result of that referendum. What's important now is to get on with the best Brexit that we can have, to have a prosperous well, you've, Britain. But you've already okay. ruled that British out, Damien. You've, yes, you've already ruled that out. I mean, you were on the Remain side. You must be looking at what's happening with, with dismay. You know, Theresa May standing there and saying, well, before we even talk to our European counterparts, we're going to rule out being in the single market. We're not even going to try and see if that's possible. Surely to have that trade without all of those barriers, without all of those costs on businesses, is trying to export. That is, if you are going to say, let's make the best possible Brexit, try and bring the country but, but together after a divisive... Brexit at all. We've no, got to I don't... respect the view. I mean, no, we, uh, we fought, but we lost. But my point is you're We've not got respecting to respect the, the view. view of the people. You're not even doing that, though, because you're already ruling out what would be the best version of Brexit. All right, well, your quest, yes. yes. All right, and let's come, let's come, OK. They've got a lot of hands up. Let's respect our audience and hear from them as well. But Briefly, Stephen, yeah. if you want. Look, the SNP has been described as an effective opposition. But on another point, Damien talks about fearing the House of Lords. The House of Lords is a democratic ab abomination, and it will have absolutely no impact on the House of Lords after this general election. It will still be there, it will still be unelected, and it will still have an impact on each and every one of us. But why not scrap it? Because I voted for um, a, a fully democratically elected House of Lords when it, when it came up well, uh, a couple of parliaments ago. Uh, it it's not for the government to abolish uh, Houses of Parliament, it's for Parliament to do that. But what is important is that we have a strong and stable government to get the deal. We can argue about what type of deal we want, but it seems to me unarguable that if you have a strong elected Prime Minister with a new elected mandate, Britain's position will be put better right. in those vital Let's negotiations. See, you, sir, in the middle there. Yes. Yes, you're waving at me. Yep. Yes, so if, if we're going to have an election, can we at least have a grown-up election? Um, I bet my wife uh, £10 that Damien Lewis would say um, coalition of chaos and strong and stable <laughs> government in his first <laughs> contribution. <laughs> uh, 
Would that be, would that be Damien, would that be Damien, mean, Damien, Damien Lewis or Clive Green you were talking about? I'm, I'm, I'm flattered Damien, to be compared Damien, with Damien Lewis. Lewis. Has he called the repetitive cliché virus off his boss? <laughs> Please let's have a more grown-up debate where we use the language of Shakespeare yeah. with a All right, bit hold on. more OK, the woman in the third row there, you... The general public were upset when Theresa May got into power unelected. Now that there is an election, everyone still seems to be upset because apparently she's being manipulative. How does she stand a chance to please anyone? Yeah. <laughs> OK. <laughs> and, and you, sir, here. <laughs> yes, you, sir. The chaos we're looking at today, and I'm not Damien Green, but it identifies exactly what we shouldn't be doing in this election. We do need a unified front. And I do believe that Labour has some very good candidates. Clive is in front of us today, and there are others. And it shouldn't be Jeremy Corbyn. It sh I'm sorry, I don't get your point. It shouldn't be what? Uh, the, the Labour leader should not necessarily be Jeremy Corbyn oh, right. going forward. OK. Uh, and, and you, next one here. Um, I think at the end of the day, you're asking people to vote on uncertainty, uncertainties. This whole Brexit thing, we don't know what we're going into. We don't know what we're voting on. We don't know what sort of agreement we're going to get. We've got two years to negotiate. We don't know if we'll be able to negotiate the sort of deal we, we want. So how can you ask people to vote on something that they just don't know, essentially? So you'd rather it had waited for three years? No, no, yeah, maybe. I don't know. I don't know what the alternative is. I just think this is the total wrong time to be calling a general election. Okay. Uh, and you on the gangway there, up there, the woman yeah. there. Um, I just, um, I mean, how, how will the government's uh, apparent lack of clarity um, on the Brexit demands uh, affect how people vote? How do they think it won't affect how people vote? Who, people who've had confidence in the Tories in the first place, uh, we've had no clarity. So you don't know what you're voting for, you mean? No. Um, and so why would you not yeah. tactically vote? Why would you... Why would a, uh, a coalition of chaos, so to speak, hmm. why would that not be uh, a better alternative? Okay. I'm going to... Thank you. That's a good point, uh, which I'd like to uh, get Simon Fisher's question. On exactly that, if I can, please. Simon Fisher. Is tactical voting undemocratic or the only way to prevent a hard Brexit? Is tactical voting, voting for a party other than your natural allegiance, and Tony Blair was saying it may mean some Labour people voting Tory this time round, is that undemocratic or is it the way to prevent a hard Brexit? Uh, Joe Swinson. Well, we have the first-past-the-post voting system, which some people would say um, can produce results which don't necessarily look like they are respecting the, the will of the overall democracy. Case in point, in the 2015 general election, half of the people in Scotland voted SNP, but 56 of the 59 seats went SNP. So many people in Scotland really felt that they were not being properly represented. And I think there will be a lot of tactical voting this time round in Scotland and indeed south of the border. And it is up to individuals to decide how to cast their vote. And for many people, avoiding a hard Brexit is going to be a top priority because they can see the chaos coming down the line. I mean, Damien Green talks about the coalition of chaos and it's actually the pursuit of this hard Brexit that is creating such chaos. And it's the Liberal Democrats that are really clearly saying this can be avoided. We have this election. It's an opportunity to vote for something else. And this okay. is the chance to send the message to Theresa May. Um. Camilla Cavendish. Well, I think tactical voting is perfectly democratic, especially because it's the only way sometimes you can break out of the tyranny of safe seats. And there are a lot of people in this country who feel it's not worth voting at all because, you know, wherever they live has always been the same way. So there's nothing wrong with tactical voting at all. Um, I'm not quite sure, though, that we have a coalition of chaos. And it's clear it's not a coalition at all. Because actually, none of you entirely agree with each other, I don't think. Well, no coalitions. Um, I think what, what, just to go back to the, the, the lady here who made the point about uncertainty, I mean, I think what most of us would value as voters is, is just much more clarity from each party about exactly what the choices are, both going into Brexit and coming out of it. Because there are some things we, as you're, you know, we don't know because it's all subject to 27 other countries. But I would really like to see a bit more vision beyond Brexit. What are we talking about? What are you offering? What do you want this country to look like? Can okay. I... the, the man up there in the striped Jack. Yes. Hello. Um, I, I was just wondering about uh, the fact that the um, stated aim of Mrs May was that she wanted Parliament to come together, um, or Westminster to come together,
because the country has come together. The country is currently very, very divided. Mm. Yeah. You know, we've got to sort that question out. So where you were saying about we have to widen this beyond Brexit, yes, we do. But we have to address all of those issues. We have to start addressing them in the debate rather than just saying it's this or, or that because along party lines. Because it was get, um, get your heads together. Because yeah, it is yeah, the biggest yeah. issue that we've got. Uh, uh, Damien Green, it was that the Prime Minister who said that the country was united, but Parliament wasn't. But what's the evidence that the country is united on this? Well, the, the country went through a vote last year, and I think the the thing, that, the, the most divisive thing we're hearing this evening is is the constant repetition of hard Brexit. And and for those also who, who quite reasonably say, you know, what are you about? Um, what clarity do you want? Read the Prime Minister's Lancaster House speech in which she set out in as much detail as you can before you go into uh, a negotiation what she wanted to achieve with Brexit, which included a key phrase that where she said she wanted a close and special partnership with the European Union. I think the, the sensible position for Britain to take uh, Camilla's point about where do we want to be at the end of this process is that we will be outside the European Union. That's what the British people voted for. You know, let, and, and we, we obviously accept that. But obviously it's still one of our, our largest trading areas. They are neighbouring friendly democracies. We want to have a close partnership with them from the outside. Now, that doesn't mean, uh, mean being a member of the single market because uh, that would involve accepting the European Court of Justice. And I think one of the uh, the lessons we all had to take uh, from the referendum was that, that that's an unacceptable interference in the democracy uh, of this country. Uh, people wanted more control uh, over immigration to this country and, and people wanted us to have more control over our own budget. So within those parameters, then what we want to do is negotiate a deal that makes trade flow as freely as possible uh, and that preserves our yeah. friendship and our cooperation on things like security. But, but, that seems to me a very, very sensible and strong vision of Britain's future. Yeah, but, and if we can achieve that, we will have achieved uh, a lot. Do, do, right. do, do, yeah. Do you, expect, do you expect, though, on the, on the tactical voting, the people who voted, who were in the 48%, like you, who voted to remain, will abandon the Conservative Party and go for other parties, the Liberal Democrats, no. or Labour, I, I or mean, in I, I Scotland, mean, what, your what, party? Why, why the other parties... Why would they vote for you are, if, they're, saying, if they're against it? Why would they well, vote for well, you? Well, I, I, I was against it, but as I say, I accept the... The, the Prime Minister was against it, but we accept... Yeah, but the you accept, and you've seen the polling vote. shows that people who voted that way don't well, accept they don't. it. They, they, they still I mean, feel I, as actually, they did. funny enough, most, most people haven't changed their mind uh, very much over the year. But if anything, but, the latest switch was that people have moved from Brexit that was, that, was, that was 2%. So, yeah, but it was a poll. It's, it's, just I mean, not, you know, it's just not moving very much. And I think, frankly, polls, polls are overrated. I'm, I'm struck oh. by people assuming... Uh, there's oh, there's oh, 20% oh, you're nervous now. now. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, because I've seen, you know, we saw the Trump election, we, we saw uh, the referendum vote itself. We've seen polls get things wrong. So nobody... You know, there were people assuming the result of the election. Not they yet. absolutely shouldn't do that. Okay. And the, the tactical... Sorry, one more last point, and then I'll shut up for a bit. The, uh, the tactical voting uh, point is... Yeah, fine, obviously, it's, it's a free country, you can vote tactically. But have in your mind that if you're voting tactically, what you might wake up with on June the 10th is Jeremy Corbyn as Prime Minister. Oh, Do you so really want that? That's not credible. That's not credible. Right. Stephen yeah. Gettings. On, on the point, Joe, Joe mentioned earlier on that the SNP did, did well this election, not in past elections, on, um, on the current system. Look, I'm in favour of proportional representation. The, the, this next parliament is going to be very, very important in terms of our rights, the environment, what, what, kind of, what, what kind of UK emerges from leaving the European Union. Now, actually, I'm, I'm going to say something, is that actually maybe it's no bad thing forcing politicians from different parties to work together. I was only elected two years ago, and one thing I've noticed with the Europe portfolio is I've had to, and, and I've wanted to, try and work with colleagues in the Liberal Democrats and Labour and in the Green Party on areas where we agree, like trying to keep EU nationals here, trying to maintain research funding, trying to fight against austerity. I think when you get one party in control, like the Tories, on just 36% of the vote, you end up in a mess. Not all of us have all the answers. And that's why it's good that you reach across the political aisle where you possibly can and reach agreement. And Westminster needs to get better at that. Well, okay. except, except and, 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 No, it's, it's Clive's turn. Clive Lewis, you in favour of tactical voting. You appear to be voting tactically by not confronting Caroline Lucas the Green in Brighton. You approve of that? Is that happening? Well, 
I think people have always voted tactically. Uh, totally voted tactically. Um, people, uh, I think the electorate understand what they want to achieve under the first past the post system and they can vote accordingly. I think where the Green Party, they've stood down in uh, Rupert Huxley in Ealing. Uh, and I believe they may also have stood down in Brighton, Kemp Town. And I applaud that because actually that's a grown up politics where they understand that actually what's at stake here in this general election, potentially one of the most important general elections in the post-war period, goes beyond and transcends party, po party politics. And I think they should be applauded for what they've done personally. However, I also understand that as a national party, the Labour Party understands that in this election, it is about Brexit and it underlies everything. But it's also about the future of the national healthcare system. It's also about the future of education in this country. Yeah. It's also about the future of social care. There are other issues here at stake. And I think people have to vote accordingly and think about that very carefully. And obviously in Norwich South, people will be voting, I think, many people will vote tactically. They understand in Norwich South that under, after me, there's a Conservative candidate who will push through Theresa May's hard Brexit. They've got a clear choice. But they you, can vote you, for you, a Labour MP yeah. and try to stop that. You praise the Liberal Democrats for not standing against the Greens. Would you like to see Labour not stand against the Greens? Would you like to see Labour not stand against the Liberal Democrats in certain seats? I think the, the, the problem there is that the Labour Party, the problem, <laughs> the problem there is that the Labour Party is a, is a national party and we stand in every seat and we always have. In the future though, I think, you know, I personally also believe in proportional representation and we have a first past the post system. And I think it's, a, it's an ugly political system, it's an immature political system from the 19th century. I think we need to change it and I think we need to give people real choice in who their politicians are and what their politics okay. are. And I think it'll make for a better politics in this country. You sit up there. Uh, no. Clive, yeah, and I agree with Clive that he just mentioned that it's more than just Brexit. Yet then why is he shying away by not voting in favour of the general election so Labour can bring forward their ideas in order to improve health care and social care? If, you know, if he wanted to have that you know, imp you know, implemented within our country, then why is he not voting well, for a general well, election straight okay. away? Okay. No, no, I, I want, to, I want one, no you, can, you can do what you like in a moment. Um, you can, uh, there are a lot of hands up. The woman there in, in purple. Yes. Um, thank you. I just, um, I suppose going back to what Damien just said, I get really frustrated when I hear politicians and anyone actually talk about the people. I feel like um, Theresa May and the government are kind of going on this grand quest to sort of give the people what they asked for. And I, I did vote Remain, but I accept that pe not everyone did. But actually, in fact, the people that voted Brexit only make up 30% of the electorate. And I think that people forget this. And... Um, they're on a sort of arrogant quest, trying to impress these people that think that they, you know, they're trying to impress. Now, 30 percent, if you don't count, I mean, if, if, you, you, if you include people who didn't vote, which if is... If you include if, people who didn't vote, you don't and know that's how not the people including... who didn't vote were going to vote, though, yes, did you? Yes, no, sure, and but that doesn't include children, that doesn't include babies who are going to be affected more than yeah. people that are going to slope off this earth. Okay. You know? Uh, okay. <laughs> it's not... And I'll take one more point from you, sir, in the, in, just in front there, yes. Yeah, I, I, I can't understand the, uh, the, the Theresa May's position here, because she's called a general election that she, does, she clearly doesn't want to participate in herself. And her Why do you say that? Well, because she's, she, she's not wanting to do a debate. She's, yeah. she's standing back. Yeah. From... <laughs> she, she's standing back from doing all but minimal TV interviews. And as far as I can see, the Tories want to talk about two things. They want to talk about Brexit. We had a referendum on Brexit last year. Uh, and the other thing they want to do is just uh, throw abuse at Jeremy Corbyn. Yeah. I haven't heard a single... <laughs> I haven't heard... I haven't heard a single policy. I haven't heard a single policy on uh, on, on healthcare, on education, on, on on welfare, on immigration from 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 the Conservatives. It's just that they want to focus on Brexit again, and they want to throw mud at Jeremy Corbyn. Big, big, big brief, if you would. I, 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 uh, two very quick points. Uh, no, no debates. You, well, you will see an awful lot. Theresa has actually been campaigning around the country, uh, meeting people in workplaces and yeah, so on. Not, but he's and, talking and about we'll debates. Be, and Jeremy we'll be doing Corbyn. huge numbers uh, of big uh, TV interviews. You, 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 the you, difference that between be an interview and a debate, and, isn't there? And, and she, and she you, will look, be, here, you're debating, she, she right? Will be, she will there be, are five <laughs> different opinions, right? She will be... If you and I were just talking to each other, that's not a but, debate. But, but, but we it's be me talking, asking you questions. We would be talking to the audience, and, and she'll be doing yeah, that, that as well. but that doesn't count, And the second it? point, do wait, yeah, okay, if, if you can, that point if you can contain Why yourself... Why won't you do a debate? You can contain yourself... Can I talk about the manifesto point? Because he said that... This gentleman said there are no policies. Do wait for our manifesto. It's coming out in about ten days' time. 
uh, and that will satisfy your desire for you policies the for the future. You called the election, so surely you should be able to get your policies out before Labour did. OK. OK. Let's... Oh no, yeah, go on. Just make a point, make a point on this. I really am really disappointed that she has not agreed to do a TV debate mm -hmm. because she... She is making this election partly about strong leadership and she should get out there and cut through the media because the great thing about a TV debate is you're not being translated all the time by the newspapers. You can talk direct to the public and say what you think. She should get out there and she should take on Jeremy Corbyn and she should do that now. Why do you think she won't? <laughs> That's, I think, um, she said. well, po the politicians here would know better than me. I think politicians are always no, reluctant no, no, no. to put themselves in that position. She, she does I, every week. No, we have no, 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 no. Sorry, Damon, it's, not, it's not the same. No. I mean, TV debates are not perfect, but we've now got used to them. People expect them. And as I said, yeah. she is putting herself forward as a strong leader, and she should have the courage to just come and do the debate. Yeah, okay, you say. <laughs> I really think there's a lack of clarity um, from Theresa May, and I've lost all confidence in the Conservative Party over the last six months. Over the last...? Well, over, over the, the Brexit negotiations, it's just, you know, calling this general election, I, I've lost all confidence in the Conservatives. OK. Well, let's take, let's take one issue that is going to come up, or may come up. Um, Robert, Robert Harris, please. Robert Harris. Why haven't the main political parties promised to end the rank betrayal of my generation that is the triple lock on pensions? <laughs> in, in other words, you think the pen pensioners are benefiting at your expense, at the expense of your future? Yeah, it makes perfect sense to link pensions to average earnings, to inflation. It makes no sense to commit to a minimum annual increase of 2.5%, regardless of what is going on in the actual economy producing a constant ratcheting up of costs. And at a time when the average pensioner household is better off than the average working household, it's my generation that's having to foot the bill, and it's my generation that's going to have to wait longer and longer to receive our pensions um, as the government tries to, to keep the, the cost of pensions under control. Do you anticipate it may be dropped in the Tory manifesto? Well, I, I hope it will be. We'll hear from Damien, I hope. But, uh, yeah, I he's the boss of this bit. He is. <laughs> um, it has absolutely no logic... It's got no basis in equity. Um, it's a cynical attempt by the parties to attract a certain demographic, and it really needs to be scrapped. You're just out for the old vote, Damien Green. I, 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 I genuinely think that's unfair. And, and can I break all the rules of uh, pre-election uh, question times by being non-partisan uh, for a bit? Uh, the, the, to, to put in perspective, um, and first of all, for, for you know, young people will grow old and will want a decent pension system at one day. So I think this, this sort of dichotomy of, of either you care about the old or the young is wrong, that actually you know, young people grow old as well. But, but more importantly, um, the triple lock and the action on pensions that have been taken over the past 30 years by all parties, not, not just my party, but when we were in coalition with the Lib Dems uh, and before that with, with, with other uh, parties in government, have meant a tremendous reduction in pensioner poverty in this country. Uh, in, the, in the 70s and 80s, 40% of pensioners in this country lived in poverty. That was disgraceful. We've got that figure now right down to 14%. Still too high, there's more to do, but that is, is a completely unrecorded, huge social achievement in this country. We have done an awful lot in a generation to get rid of pension of poverty. Okay. And we should be proud of that. And, and sorry, the, the final uh, point... Answer I, Robert Harris. I, I, Ro let I, him, I, let I, him I, just answer you. Put it that way around. Robert Harris. Sorry. Well, um, that's absolutely true, and it is obviously crucially important to reduce pensioner poverty. But like I was saying, the average pensioner household now is better off than the average working household. Yeah. So when there's a trade-off between the two, the current uh, system where you uh, commit, uh, <coughs> regardless of what is happening in the actual economy, that's got to be okay. unfair. Cl Clive Lewis, what's, I think, what's your uh, view on With it? all due respect, I think the WASPy women uh, in this country would, uh, would disagree with you most strongly on yeah. that. This isn't about a race to the bottom. I'm proud uh, that pensioners in this country uh, are given... Uh, a decent pension. There are still two million of them that live in pension of poverty. But they've worked all their lives. They deserve to be looked after. They deserve that pension. And I think it's right and proper that the triple lock is there. And Labour have said, 
we will guarantee that. I think that's right. I think it's the right thing to do. But what I think, rather than play the older generation against the younger generation, what politicians should be doing is saying, how do we actually tackle those who have vast amounts of wealth? We're one of the most unequal countries in the Western world. So I know where I would be looking to make sure that pensioners had the money that they needed to live decently, uh, and also that young people had opportunities and chances in this life. And that's by taking it from those with the most wealth. And unfortunately, there are far too many people with far too much wealth in this country. And that's what a future Labour government would do. It would equalise that out and make sure we had a fair society that worked for all. The woman at the back. Yes. yes. I have a lot of sympathy uh, with the, the questioner there. Um, but I've got a piece of uh, advice as well, which is that his generation needs to get out and vote. Yeah, yeah. And they'll find that a lot of the benefits will start accruing to them. But uh, uh, you mean that... That's a very cynical view. <laughs> you mean that if his lot voted, he'd change his mind? He a wouldn't lot be of looking the benefits the... that accrue to pensioners are because we all know that pensioners get out and vote. All oh, right. Have, have you decided whether you're going to keep the triple lot? Uh, wait for a manifesto. I'm saying... I didn't ask you what was in your manifesto. Well, well, I said, have you decided? Uh, it's, no, everything is under discussion. I'm not going to uh, discuss the process of the manifesto either. I'd love to do this. It would make life easier. People wouldn't boo. But I'm afraid we will release our manifesto uh, when we release our manifesto, and you can see it all then. OK. Joe Swinson. Well, I think it sounds like Robert, who asked the question, will be happy with the Conservative uh, manifesto on this, but probably less happy with my answer. So it was the Liberal Democrats who actually brought forward the triple lock. It was our policy that made it into the coalition agreement and that we delivered because over a period of many years, the state pension had fallen so far behind what average working households were taking home. And pensioners will remember the insult under the Labour government of the 75 pence a week rise. So it was clear that something did have to be done about that. And I no think that making sure that... Now. I think that making sure that there is dignity in retirement is important. Mm. Now, I think there are arguments about what you can do about, you know, uh, very excessive you know, tax relief on high rate tax relief for people putting into their pension pots. I think there's things that could be done, but the basic state pension is about dignity in retirement. And so, um, so, so I don't think that, that the Conservatives dithering on this is actually, is actually helpful. But you're right to talk about working age people too, because this isn't just about people at one end of the age spectrum. And what we've seen under this government have been, frankly, cruel cuts in welfare on people who are struggling to make ends meet, who are going out and working hard. You know, these are, frankly, the cuts that we spent five years in coalition stopping them making, making and absolutely minimised. No, we, we, we vetoed the £12 billion of cuts, oh, come on. the tax credits and the universal credit. And you know what? You really should be thinking twice when you are having to get officials to design an eight-page form for mothers who have experienced sexual assault and are in distress to fill in to affirm that their child is the product of rape in order to make sure that they can get enough money to feed their children. When you're having to design a form like that, you know your policy is wrong. Lisa. Yeah. The workplace pension scheme was brought in, which was a brilliant idea to help actually young people build up a pension for later on in life. OK, so, seven and a half million well, people are now using it. It's a Steve, great success. The, yeah. I think uh, on the triple lock pension, and there, this is where I respectfully would, would disagree, those who'd be impacted if, when the Tories go ahead with their plans to, to cut that, like so many things, will not be the richest pensioners, will actually be the, the poorest pensioners, will be those who are struggling to make ends meet. And this is where we're seeing some disgraceful pa practices. It's like the WASPy women, the pension inequality. These are women for whom that makes a big difference and not being told that your pension is being cut. People were planning for their pensions for a long, long time. And the WASPy women have got a point, and that's exactly the sort of area where we should be pulling together and giving them the equality that they it's deserve. You've, you've okay. got the power to do that in Scotland. Your government you know, in Scotland your... can do that. Do you know, if I you keep really cared about it, well, and didn't I, just want to whinge about it, I keep hearing this from the Tories. I keep hearing this from the Tories. It's like that. the rape clause that Joe rightly brought up. That's a disgrace, an absolute disgrace. And what we hear from yeah, the yeah, Tories yeah. is, oh, well, pensions, you can sort that out. Pensions. That affects everybody. Secondly, the, 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 UK, the Scottish government has put £300 million into offsetting some of the worst decisions that have been made so, by yeah, a council government, point, like getting rid really of the bedroom tax. Now, we can do that. Stephen, do that. 
Well, on the I'm point not quite sure what pensions, it was. What was your point? What is the point? What do I have to offset, the, Damien? You're just talking about not on this The Scottish government, which, which likes to complain about the fact that the pension age has been equalised, which is a sensible thing to do, and which was actually done as far back as 1995, but you, you, you make a big issue of this, but you know that you Wait, have Damien. the power in Scotland, if you say Scottish women, Scottish uh, women of a certain age deserve higher pensions, you could pay That's those pensions. That's nonsense. Now, you would Damien, much prefer to women were planning for their pensions. They it. received letters being told that they would receive their so pensions by a certain date, and the they didn't. They no, didn't, sorry, and sorry, it was an uh, Stephen, absolute Stephen, disgrace. Uh, and the Stephen. Scottish government has going, yeah. been going through times on the bedroom tax, on various yeah, other yeah. issues, cleaning do up it, your it, mess. Stephen. Cleaning up your mess. He, he, well, I think, <laughs> if I'm hearing him right, uh, he's saying you could do something about pensions, but you choose not to. Well... <laughs> <laughs> The Scottish, the, Scottish the Scottish government has had its budget cut. It'll have a no, budget cut by £2.9 billion. Pounds. On the rape clause, do you know what the Tory answer was to the rape clause? No, oh, it shouldn't matter, you can just offset that. Tell you what, this will make it easier. Why don't we just vote against the rape clause and get rid of it at Westminster and it solves the problem for everybody pensions, in the United Kingdom? Pensions. All right. OK. The, the man, a young man there, and it was a young man who asked the question over here, what's your view? Maybe it's completely different. Well, the man there mean, on the, on the I, right. Yeah, I, I'd just like to uh, agree with Clive and also uh, Joe and Stephen. Uh, the fact is, since, I think, 2010, the number of people who are reliant on food banks has gone up from the tens of thousands to the millions. Mm -hmm. The number of people who are rough sleepers has doubled. Yeah. And so everyone knows that Oxford obviously has a huge homelessness problem, yes. a huge number of people who are really the most marginalised in our society. And if you go out and talk to them, they include pensioners, but they also include young people. The fact is, drawing this, making it an intergenerational conflict is, I think, ignoring the point of the huge wealth inequalities in our country and the fact that okay. no one is talking about have you spoken on this? You have. Okay. You've done. You've done. Have you spoken? No. Come in the Cavendish. Robert, how old are you? Can I ask you how old you are? So you've basically got student debt, you're having to pay rent, you probably will have, I don't know, how many more years before you can get on the housing ladder? 15, Hang on, 20. too many personal questions here. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just, I wasn't sure because you could be... No, just just say what you're about to say. You've heard so what he said. I, I think I agree with you. I mean, I think... This is really, these are really difficult decisions. Um, the triple lock at 2.5% is unsustainable given all the other demands on public spending. And there is a younger generation that are having to bear enormous burdens of debt and cuts. And I actually think, I know a lot of pensioners have suffered from low interest rates, so people who are dependent on savings, they really have genuinely suffered since, since the financial crisis, that's absolutely right. But if we move to a double lock, which would still index the pension to wages or prices. We wouldn't be getting rid of that. That would be still indexed. It would give you some guarantee. I think that would be an awful lot fairer. OK. And no, I think we have to move on because um, it's 40 minutes. 40 minutes have gone. We're going to be, um, just let me say this, in Wigan next week, for those of you watching around Wigan and Edinburgh the week after that. So do come and take part. The address and the number to ring, I'll give them at the end, uh, are there. Right, a question, please, from Rosanna Mills. Rosanna Mills. With tensions rising, should we be more concerned about Kim Jong-un or Donald Trump? <laughs> Trump or Kim Jong-un? With tensions rising, who is more concerning? Stephen Gethins. Um, can't we be um, concerned about both of them? Yeah. Um, I think that... that, that... You know, what, what, one thing that strikes me, and I heard Boris Johnson today, and you raise a really good point, trying to give the US government sort of almost carte blanche over how they deal with Syria. I mean, Syria and, and, and North Korea are extraordinarily complicated um, international situations. I'm not entirely sure Boris Johnson is the best person to be dealing with them, as far as I'm concerned. But, but, but there you go. These are horribly complicated situations whereby simply advocating military action all the time doesn't work. What you need is to invest in a long-term peace strategy. The, the conflict in Syria, I know you didn't mention it, but I think it comes into it. The, the, the conflict in, in Syria has been going on for six years. That should shame all of us. I mean, that's not that far away. That's why we have a refugee crisis at the moment. When we've got Tories trying to block people out of the country, it's because you have a mess in Syria and a mess that we caused in Libya as well, which is causing lives. And this is something that should 
they should be the concern of each and every one of us. But that requires investment, it requires investment in international development, and I'm afraid that's over decades in terms of an investment. And I don't have a huge amount of confidence that, as this government is focused solely on dragging us out of the European Union, it will have the wherewithal to start tackling these problems sensibly. But you, you, you're answering a serious question, but it seems to be a different question from the one that was asked, well, which, was okay. about, which was about North Korea. I think uh, on I, the... I, I, you, I mean, no yeah. reason for you not to talk about Syria. Um, do, do you think, uh, from your point of view, that we should take part if the Americans ask us in bombing Syria? Um, I, I don't think you should just, just because the Americans ask you to go and bomb somebody, no, I don't think you should just go and bomb them. I mean, we have a situation in Syria that's multipolar. You have Turkish troops on the ground, Russian troops on the ground, American troops on the ground, and, and this vastly complicated situation. A few years ago, the, the government asked us to, to bomb one side, and then a couple of years ago, or last year, we were asked to bomb another side. Do you know, maybe the answer is not in just bombing people. Maybe the answer is bringing people round the tables to talk about it and investing. We've invested in Bosnia, for instance, over the past 25 years. And it's only now, after that kind of decades-long commitment to that country, that you're seeing some progress towards the European Union. Ironically, we're encouraging them to join the European Union just as we okay. turn our backs let's, on it. All right. Let, yes. let, let me drag us back to, to North Korea. Um, Clive Lewis. Um, I think the key difference between Donald Trump and Kim Il jong well, there are quite a few, but... As far as I know it, Kim Il jung isn't waiting there with his knife and fork to take over uh, the NHS with his uh, corporate colleagues in the United States if we get the hard Brexit that Theresa May and Damien wants to see. Um, but the, 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 just to, to, uh, but to draw it back to foreign policy, I, look, I think on the issue of Kim Il jung and North Korea, I'm deeply unhappy that we have someone like Donald Trump, a very thin-skinned individual in the White House, uh, on, uh, on a, a hair-trigger issue with North Korea. And I think that we need a government, we need a foreign secretary and a prime minister that is prepared not just to suck up to the United States, but to stand up to them when needs be. And if you look at Syria, as has been mentioned, I think, the, I think many people here, when they saw what happened in Syria, they understood that something very nasty, very bad had happened. And I understand people wanted to do something, and I get that, because that's what the British people are like. They, like, they, 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 they embrace justice, and I get that. But this is two things here. The first thing is, there was no evidence. And I think Chilcott taught us some very important lessons about the evidence. I imagine it was him, but I haven't seen the evidence yet. Secondly, in terms of strategy, there is no strategy. You have religious wars raging across the Middle East. You have 15 years of the war on terror that has cost trillions and hundreds of thousands of lives, and nothing has happened so far. And in terms of international law, look, this is the key thing here. If you're going to bomb a country, after the Second World War, what we said as a nation is that we all got together and we said having big unilateral decisions made by big players on the world stage doesn't end too well. It ended in the Second World War. We don't want that. So we want the rule of law. And if you want to be able to look Russia and China and other countries in the eye, you have to operate within the rule of law. And that means that what Donald Trump did on Syria, although we might like it because we think it feels good, the reality is it set a bad precedent. And what we need to do is go through international mm. institutions because that ultimately is what the rule of law is about. How, how and that's what we as a country have always mm. said that we believe in. How confident are you about Jeremy Corbyn's leadership on this issue? Because you... <laughs> You resigned as Shadow Defence Secretary, didn't you? Yeah, well, I, from, from because you I'm, disagreed with him. I, so now you're standing, supporting him for this, and on an issue like this, serious issue, Korea, uh, Sy Syria and whether we bomb Syria, North Korea and what happens there. No, I didn't resign as Shadow Defence Secretary. You didn't? No. You were kicked out? I was shifted over. But, you know, look, you I, were shifted I, over I because know, you I, took I, the wrong line. No, I, yes. I, I knew what the policy was on Trident. I, I read the auto cue, so I, I was quite aware <laughs> of, of what the policy was. Look, I think the world needs more people like Jeremy Corbyn. We're on a, there's a lot of brinkmanship going on at the moment. And, and quite frankly, when I, when, I, when I heard the Defence Secretary Michael Fadden boasting about how he would launch a first strike, a first nuclear strike on another country in a macho way. You know, what does it come to in politics when a politician gets to boast about the fact that he's quite prepared to launch a first strike on innocent civilians that would kill tens of thousands of people? I think it's a disgrace, and I think we need more peacemakers, less warmongers. Right. Well, woman in the, back, in the middle there, in white, yes. Um, I think one of the most dangerous things about tunnel, uh, Donald Trump is the fact that his opinions and his morals are reaching people all over the world, and they're not particularly 
respectable morals, especially towards women, for instance. I think it's truly disgusting, his comments towards women yeah. and about them. And why, are, why aren't our politicians doing more to stand up against that and say, no, this is wrong, when instead we're being left to people like J.K. Rowling to tweet and say, call him up on it. Why aren't our, the people leading our country standing up against yeah. him? Damien Green. I think, I, actually, I think the last time I was on question time, it was actually just after uh, he, he made uh, some of his terrible wrong remarks, and, and, and I said so at the time, so uh, I, I'm more than happy to repeat that. But, but come on, let's get a sense of perspective here. Um, it, it sounds like, if you, if you listen to the last 10 minutes of discussion, that, that Donald Trump is, is worse than Kim Jong-un. He is a democratically elected leader of a country where, as he is discovering, there is the rule of law. There are independent institutions that mean that any American president has to obey the law. And America is a friendly democracy. And the idea that in any way you can equate that, because I think, yeah, let's take the question seriously. Who, you know, who, should, we, who should we distrust more? Kim Jong-un is a dictator at the head of, of one of the world's uh, most mad regimes that has starved many of its own people and is trying hard to develop a nuclear capacity with which it clearly wants to threaten its neighbours. There is no equation there. I think we have to be important. And, and Stephen raises the, the important point of Syria. And, and of course, any British government uh, would look at uh, individual uh, situations uh, as they develop. It is perfectly possible, it seems to me, that Assad is evil enough to use chemical weapons to kill tens of thousands of his own citizens if he thought he would get away with it. And frankly, if British or Western military power was used to save those tens of thousands of lives, I would think that was the morally right thing to do. Very international. Okay. Okay. Joe Swinson. Okay. Joe Swinson. So, clearly, without doubt, the, the North Korean uh, regime is uh, horrific and appalling. But I think there's a difference in terms of actually how much global power the American president and uh, Kim Jong-un have got in the world. And that is what makes me so worried about President Donald Trump, because we've been used to a situation where America has helped to keep the world order, um, has been a, a very positive role in world affairs, and we now have this very unstable situation where actually people can't predict what the president is likely uh, to do. Um, I think this issue really does boil down to international law, because Actually, the chemical weapon attack in Syria was one that I do think required a response. I think we have that line in the sand very clearly drawn since after the First World War that chemical weapon attacks are absolutely unacceptable. But what worried me about it was that it was unilateral action. It wasn't done through the international community. It wasn't even as if those, those um, approaches were tried. It was just done unilaterally by President Trump. And that is very worrying. And so when I hear our foreign secretary saying it would be very hard to say no. I just get shivers because I know what it's been like in the past when we have acted as America's poodle in terms of military affairs in the world. And I marched against the Iraq war in 2003. And we don't want to go back to that situation. There might be circumstances where, such as to prevent chemical weapon attacks, you might be able to have that discussion, but it needs to be done through those proper international channels. And to have the Foreign Secretary, you know, coming out with, you know, looking up his thesaurus for medieval insults for the leader of the Labour Party and then just, you know, blithely saying, oh, well, it'd be hard to say no to, to President Donald right. Trump. But frankly, I find that absolutely okay. on, terrifying. On the limit, oh, no. okay. Camilla. <laughs> I want to try and get one more question in, Camilla. If, so if you could be brief on brief. this one, that would be a help. Well, it's a great question because, of course, Kim and Trump are both utterly unpredictable. So there is a sort of horrifying similarity and we are at this bizarre stage of history, aren't we? But, of course... Trump is democratically elected and he does lead a country which has long been our ally and it is still our ally even if it's led by somebody that many of us feel slightly uncomfortable with. Um, I actually don't agree with Stephen that North Korea and Syria, Syria are similarly complex. I think North Korea is somewhat more simple. And I also, um, I'm just concerned about the, the statements about investing in international development oh, for Syria. Syria is in total crisis. Tens of thousands of people are dying. And in 2013, what President Obama did was he backed away from his red line when he thought Assad had used chemical weapons because the British Parliament didn't support action. And Obama was able to use that as an excuse not to confront Assad. And I do actually think that the use of chemical weapons is horrendous. And it has look, to be, on, I'm on, afraid, on a red line. On, 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 on the point I've been directly criticised on is, firstly, North Korea is 
an abomination that's the best way to deal with it. Secondly, and this was on the Lib Dem watch and on your watch, in Libya, we spent twice as much bombing that country as we did on reconstruction yeah. afterwards, under your watch. All right, I want, and that I... led to a failed state, which has led to many of the problems that we see in the gaps in the Mediterranean today, exacerbating the refugee and humanitarian crisis. I've got one more question. We've hardly got time, but I'd like to raise it. Simon Warne has it. Can, Simon Warne, can we have your question? Is it right for Theresa May to maintain a 12 million foreign aid budget and services such as the NHS are so clearly in need of additional funding. 12, 12 billion foreign aid budget, the 0.7. Um, uh, I, don't know, I don't know, we've only got three minutes left. It's the problem with question time. But uh, is she right to maintain that when the NHS and other places need additional funding? Um, you go on this and be, we have to be quite swift on it. Yes, she is. And I think ultimately this isn't, again, it's like the pensioners and young people. It's not a choice between playing our part in ensuring that we have a better, uh, cleaner, a fairer world where the developing nations, many of these countries are countries where many people in this audience and at home have come from and our country has benefited very much throughout its history from the developing world and empire and I think what we're doing here is actually part of that long-term strategy. We're actually making right. sure that these countries can come up and join uh, the developed world and actually stop poverty, stop those things which can create terrorism. So I think actually the 0.7% is right and proper and I think we can afford both that and to have a decently funded public services like the NHS. And do you, do you agree with that, Camilla? I started my career as an aid worker, and I have a lot of friends still in aid, and I believe that aid can do absolutely marvellous things. I also believe that having a fixed budget is a recipe for some misuse of funds, because the agencies know they've got the money and they don't always spend it wisely. And we need to, I'm afraid we still need to get an awful lot better at spending it. OK. Um, thank, you, thank you for being thank brief. Joe, if you could be brief too, because I, we I can't go for more than two minutes. We, yes. we, we should maintain it. It is for every £100 that this country has in wealth. It is spending 70 pence. And I think we have that responsibility more broadly as well as within our own country and I'm very proud that it was my Liberal Democrat colleague Michael Moore who brought in the bill to force the government to stick to the 0.7% every year. Simon Warren who asked the question, what do you think? As the saying goes, charity begins at home. Um, £12 billion is a lot of money and every week you're hearing about crisis after crisis in the NHS. £12 billion. £12 billion. Yes. Um, it's quite simply, we need more in the NHS. We don't need to be exporting it to other Damien countries. Damien Green. Uh, yes, I, I'm glad there's so much consensus that, that the, uh, the Prime Minister has said that we will stick to... Not consensus uh, the, the from him. <laughs> target ...around here. And I think, I mean, you're quite right, of course, charity begins at home, but charity doesn't need to end at home. Uh, and that we can afford, we can continue to afford to put uh, the extra money uh, we're putting into the NHS and, and other public services only because we have a strong enough economy to do that. And that's one of the key questions facing this country uh, over the uh, next few weeks is do we want to preserve the strong economy that allows us uh, to do these good uh, and generous things or do you want to put it at risk? Stephen Gethins. Look, this election is about the kind of country that we want to be. Yes, I think we have international obligations that we should have and international development spend as a good use of money. It's, a, it's also a fraction of the amount of money we're about to spend on weapons of mass destruction. There's a clear choice there. OK. You have, you have ten seconds, the man at the back in spectacles. I know you've been trying to get in. Thank quickly. you very much. My arm's been dying all evening. I mean, I think it's all well and good to have a foreign aid budget. And you, you mentioned uh, that we might be a poodle in the face of America. One way we maintain our status as a world power is by having an effective nuclear deterrent. And I can't see us remaining a, world power, a serious world power as long as Jeremy Corbyn is potentially going to become Prime Minister and get rid of a whole lot. We got okay. All right. You, you raised something we didn't get to um, <laughs> very deftly as a, a, a last hurrah uh, from you. But thank you very much indeed. I'm sorry, we do have to stop um, our hours up. We're going to be in Wigan next week, as I said earlier. Among those on the panel, the Shadow Business Secretary, Rebecca Long-Bailey, and Leanne Wood, the uh, leader of Plaid Cymru. And the week after that, we're going to be in Edinburgh. So Wigan or Edinburgh, on the screen there is the website address and the number to call, 0330. 123-9988. If you're listening on 5 Live, of course, this debate goes on until 1 on the morning. Question time, extra time. But here, my thanks to this panel, uh, to all of you who came here to uh, the Union Building in Oxford. Until next Thursday from Question Time, good night.